Thank you for listening. So my name is Andrew Bird um, and I am the Managing Director of Tilstone. Tilstone Partners is the investment advisor to Warehouse PLC. Warehouse PLC is an AIM listed real estate investment trust um, uh, with the sole focus to um, acquire, invest and hold UK warehouse and logistics assets. Um, and uh, we have a focus on the e-commerce sector within um, our uh, tenants and occupiers. So it's very much an income model. Um, uh, we came to the AIM market in September 2017 and um, uh, have had uh, three subsequent fundraisers, um, which I will touch on. But first and foremost, I'd just like to share some slides with you from independent research uh, prepared by Knight Frank, uh, just to give you a flavor of what's happening in the UK real estate market. Much of it will probably be familiar with you, but one or two anecdotes. Uh, and then we can touch on what's happening at Warehouse REIT and the um, year end results, which were 31st March of this year. So I won't go through all of these stats, but uh, just looking at the Knight Frank um, numbers, starting in the top, uh, um, top left, the the investment market last year proved to be really strong it, it, when measured by the total turnover of product being sold. So if you look at those numbers for 2020, that final quarter in dark green was a record year in terms of turnover, very much driven by, uh, as the pie chart shows in red, the North American market looking to um, take uh, exposure to stock in the UK and European um, warehouse logistics real estate market. So the likes of Exeter, um, Hillward, uh, Goldman Sachs, all looking for market share. And I should, of course, mention Blackstone, who, who's got the strongest um, exposure. Their number one investment um, conviction is European logistics. And if you haven't looked at it, you should definitely just pull up the Mileway web website, Mileway, which is their current um, um, uh, last mile warehouse um, investment strategy. So all of that weight of capital looking to deploy in the market has um, seen yield compression. Uh, yet, uh, as, as shown on the top right hand of the slide, the, the, the yield, the spread between the 10 year gilt and uh, UK industrial yields is still looking strong. So my contention is that given the supply demand dynamic, which I'll talk about, uh, even if that 10 year uh, uh, yield gilt levels rose, the, the, these markets um, in terms of real estate look strong. So just at the bottom of the slide, just perhaps moving to the bottom middle, uh, look at the annualized total returns um, by asset class. Industrial has outperformed all other asset classes over the one, three and five year period. Uh, and what I want to do is give you some insight as to what might happen next and, and why. So looking at the occupational market, and, and again, starting in the top left of the graph, the bar chart, last year we saw a record level of take up of floor area in warehouse space. Now, if you think about what was happening, the pandemic, that is a remarkable statistic, outperforming 2016, which is previous record year, over 50 million square feet was actually let. Knight Frank described it um, partly driven by retailers, race, the race for space as they transitioned out of high street retail into on, online commerce. But it's also been demand driven by the 3PL logistics companies, clearly a number of those requirements servicing the e-commerce online demand. Vacancy levels shown top, top right uh, at or around 5%. Um, and any, any commentator would say when vacancy levels in the real estate market are less than 10%, rents rise and, and development kicks on. So don't go into the bottom of the slide. Uh, rents, interesting how over a 10 year period, rents have got, gone up 25%. But, but our, this is a really interesting trend. In, in the middle of this slide, 
the consensus in terms of rental growth forecasts anticipating 2.4% per annum for the next five years. But we like to look at what we call the effort ratio. So how does the rent um, compare to the turnover as a, as a, as a percentage? Uh, and it, it's a trick that the Americans love to focus on. And what we're seeing is very low effort ratios. So um, give an example of a global golf brand, um, has a warehouse that we own uh, in Basingstoke. It's their European HQ. Last year, um, they sold just shy of 100 million pounds worth of goods across Europe. The rent is less than 0.5% of turnover. So it's a very small overhead cost, and yet that building is key to the European operation. And so we can see these buildings uh, being very economically relevant to the occupiers, and therefore um, uh, rental growth it, it, potential uh, offer is very strong. So um, when we look at uh, the market in terms of uh, industrial demand, actually on this slide, I'm just going to take you to the, the um, manufacturer's um, PMI index. Um, back in February, it, it pushed up to 57, just over 57. Uh, last month in May, it was 65 and a half, which was a record high. So the takeaway here is that it's not just e-commerce that is driving demand for these warehouses. Our buildings are relatively straightforward structures and, and in the right location, they are fit for purpose for a whole range of different potential occupiers. So whether it's distribution, manufacturing, assembly, um, that it's the same building which is fit for purpose. But the structural change in the market has definitely come from online, and you'll all be very familiar with online sales growth. I mean, last year, online sales growth over 70% year on year, uh, and now uh, online sales is reckoned to be about a third of total sales. So, so for us, it's interesting when the likes of Knight Frank stay, that for every 1 billion of increased online sales, it requires another 1.35 million square feet to support that turnover. Their takeaway is over the next three years, this will drive demand for another 93 million square feet. Now, just to put that in context, 93 million square feet, this vacancy level that I showed you here of around 5% equates to 30 million square feet compared to the e-commerce driving another 93 million. Um, of late, the market has been building about 20 million square feet per annum, anticipated to be higher this year in 2021. But clearly, if, if the market um, took the whole of the current void and we continue to build 20, 20 million square feet per annum, there is still going to be a shortage within uh, over that three year period because there are obviously other tenants driving demand for space. All of the current vacancy will not be fit for purpose, will not be in the right location. So our takeaway is that there is going to be an acute shortage of stock um, in part driven by this growth of e-commerce uh, and the, the dynamic shift away from high street sales to, to online sales. So um, that's the backdrop to our particular market uh, of UK warehouse and logistics space. And now perhaps just um, uh, uh, some moments on our own highlights. So these slides were reported at the year end, 31st March, um, 2021. So um, it, it, from a, an operational point of view, it was a busy year. We raised another uh, just shy of 200 million pounds of equity from to two separate events, um, but the, the, for, the, the performance came through, I just touched on the financial performance here, the total accounting return 20, just over 27% in the year. <clears throat> it came through from like for like valuation uh, increase of 18.8% ahead of the CBRE, uh, UK monthly index for all industrial 10.7%, giving, um, valuation of just under 800 million, equating to 135.1 pence per share. And that uh, increase was net 
of just over 11 million of acquisition costs and 2.5 million of, of capex during the year. <coughs> like for like, rental growth was up 2.9%, ER, ERV growth by 3.7%. <clears throat> so just um, uh, the company was IPO'd in September of 2017. Since when we have driven uh, total shareholder returns, a combination of share price and uh, dividend of 60, just under 65 <clears> percent, <throat> and the compound annual growth rate has been 13.9 percent ahead of our 10 percent forecast at IPO. Excuse me. Just two slides on the financial highlights. Um, the year and uh, the IFRS profit of 123 million is, um, I'd say, flattered by the revaluation uplift of um, 105 million. Um, the earnings, uh, adjusted earnings per share, dropped in the year from 6.5 to 5.3. This is a function of the new shares in issue. So at the beginning of the year, there were 240 million shares that jumped with the two equity raises to just under 225 million shares. So um, the earnings were spread obviously over a, sh a wider share base. Um, and, and this is the function of cash drag on investing that capital. Um, for me, the interesting point was in the final quarter of the year, um, the, the quarterly dividend uh, was covered by the earnings. So um, for looking forward on the forward radar, um, that gives us um, a very positive position to be contemplating our continued progressive dividend policy. And, and just looking at the balance sheet, I think the key points here is the Against the valuation, just under 800 million, the debt is net debt is just under 200. So again, responding to shareholder uh, comment, we very deliberately reduced the loan to value. We were tracking 40%. Uh, we're down at less than 25 at year end. We've made a positive statement that we will look to bring that up, but into the mid 30s, 34, 35% long term loan to value um, for the foreseeable future. So the economic relevance of our portfolio is very much um, demonstrated by the successful rent collections through the last year. 80, 98, sorry, 98.6% rents collected. And um, uh, we are very much continuing in the same vein uh, since year end. Um, the last stat on this graph at top right obviously was um, reported in March, but um, I can tell you that's moved on again and obviously um, there's a June quarter rent uh, subsequently. So um, just in terms of the operational side, moving away from the finances, having raised 200 million, we deployed um, 226 million in the, in the period, uh, a, a number of separate individual acquisitions, a blended net initial yield of, of 6%. Uh, but but we buy th assets with things to do. So we have definitely strengthened what we call our pandemic proof income with the likes of Amazon now accounting for over 10% of our rent in four separate buildings. Um, but we, we are very keen um, on ensuring that dividend is covered. Um, what we are seeing is, is tenants signing longer leases, but buying, when I said economic locations, you know, Birmingham, just off the M42, Rugby, just off the M6, Liverpool, M62 location, Milton Keynes on the M1, Harlow on the M11. So buying in strong locations with things to do in terms of asset management. Valuation slide, a lot of stats here, but if we just look at the six uh, boxes in the bottom left, portfolio valuation, obviously significant increase through acquisition and value. We currently now have 43 million of contracted rent and by the valuer's estimate, the ERV, the estimated rental value, so that would be the valuer's um, assessment of what the rent would be today if it was to be relet, is 4.2 million pounds higher. Really interestingly, the valuation equates to 90 pounds per square foot capital value. That compares, for, value, for insurance purposes, we have a reinstatement valuation, 
which is 103 pounds per square foot capital value. So effectively, the, the assets are, are, are valued at less than the cost of replacement. You could say the land is in for nothing. During the year, we've also increased the WALT, uh, weighted unexpired lease term from 5.2 to 5.8 through active asset management and acquisition. And the final point on this slide is look at the, the valuation approach to the multi-let estates. Um, we, we are seeing initial net initial yield of 5.5, 6.1, 6.2, reversionary yield 6.3, 6, 6.97%. This is where I think the, the management will make um, good progress in the um, near term. Um, just two points off the next slide. Uh, E-commerce, um, we, we assess that over half of our tenants are focused on selling their goods directly to their customer base via the internet. And of the other um, part of the portfolio, a sizable proportion is using the space to service that e-commerce um, um, route to market. Our vacancy rate continues to fall, um, no surprises given the strength of the occupational market. We also continue our active asset management model. So again, since IPO, um, new lettings uh, are 9% on average uh, ahead of valuers ERV. Our lease renewals on average are 13% ahead of the previous passing rent. Uh, it's a trend that continues post the year end um, uh, event that we, we just have commented on. So strong growth in, in, in across all of our assets. In terms of uh, the occupiers, uh, these are all warehouse buildings. So Asda, Argos, DFS, uh, Boots, these are all warehouses that facilitate their online offer. Obviously, Victorian Plumbing just come to market by way of an IPO. Lathwaite's is their direct wines warehouse, bonded warehouse in Gloucester. Um, John Lewis is one of six warehouses, obviously been so key to their online offer last year. And as I said, Amazon in four separate buildings within the portfolio. So, so just um, keep an eye on time. A couple, perhaps a, a couple of um, um, case studies. Um, may, maybe multi let estate here that we acquired uh, uh, M6 location, junction 18, um, uh, over half a million square feet, average rent £5.35 per square foot. We've just leased this building at £7 a foot, this one just north of £7 per square foot. So, very um, much a a, a growth story. We've acquired adjacent land. We're talking to an occupier on a 15-year lease for um, open storage. Um, so plenty of things to do. Uh, we're constantly looking at investing around our estates when we buy in a location. But that 15-year lease is definitely a trend we're seeing tenants committing to longer dated leases, a confidence in their underlying business and a realization of how constrained the supply side is. Uh, uh, just another um, uh, case study that examples, we, bu we love buying short dated income. You get more initial yield, but we buy it having done our research. This was a warehouse let to Iron Mountain, document storage business, 2.1 million cardboard boxes in the warehouse, seven, sorry, five mezzanine levels. We bought with less than six, six months left on the lease um, and they weren't going to go anywhere. Uh, and sure enough, they signed a new 10 year lease uh, at a rent 26% higher than the previous passing rent. Um, so uh, material movement in value as a result of the uplift in rent and the longer lease term. We have um, 101 estates. Inevitably, there are some with underutilized land. Uh, uh, it is very much a, an income model, but we do look to extract value and where we can get a planning permission and look to pre-let, uh, then those, those are opportunities that we can extract value from in the portfolio. There is one estate at, at Radway in Crewe, Cheshire, again, just on the M6 motorway, where the scale of the opportunity is, is, is sizably bigger. We're working with our adjoining landowner who has the land edge red, we're edge blue, um, 
but this will come forward over a number of years uh, on the back of uh, Occupy Demand. Um, our, our, obviously, sustainability is um, a front and centre of our thinking. Uh, I can take questions on it if appropriate. Final point before I wrap up is the, the built-in opportunity within the portfolio. It's the passing rent that, put, that pays the earnings per share, and yet um, um, with a number of our lettings, we've given, given away rent-free periods, which are anything from three to 12 months. So this is a short-term phenomena, which will see the passing rent rise to the contracted rent near term. Uh, in theory, um, we've also, will let the voids and we'll push the um, ERV on again, but um, word of caution, whilst we will let this vacant space, other voids will come on. Uh, we assume a long-term void, uh, running void of 5%. We like an element of vacancy. It gives us the chance to take back refurbished buildings, push the rental evidence on, and we continue to work the estate on that basis. So my takeaway for you, or, or last thought is, average rents still only £5.50 per square foot. The effort ratios are extraordinarily low for a number of these operators. There is an economic moat constraining supply in terms of new demand. So we think that the, the market forecast of 2.4% per annum annual rental growth for the next five years, it is our task to outperform that forecast in terms of our stock selection, remembering management and the board have between them 28 million shares and none of us have sold any stock since the IPO. Thank you very much. Happy to take questions. Okay, we'll try and whip through some of these questions quickly. Um, vacancy rates have risen over the last two years. How do you assess the risk of cyclical oversupply in near term? So, um, the the in terms of um, available space in the economically relevant locations. So I think M1 is the spine of distribution in the UK. The vacancy is in outlying geographical areas. Um, we see very little risk of any oversupply. When you are contemplating bill cost um, or, of for multi-let estates, remembering that 65% of our portfolio in multi-let estates, your bill cost alone is £75 per square foot. There are no economies of scale, under, unlike uh, large boxes. Um, so, so it is very difficult still to buy land, to build, and then to make a profit. And without profit, there is no new supply. So we actually think very little new supply coming onto the market. And I've had another question on there. So do you, do you buy assets all built or do you ever build any of your own? So our key model is uh, our typical assets are estates of 150,000 square feet, built anything from 1980s through to the noughties. Um, we to date have not built any of our own stock, um, but it is a, a, a um, an area that we're looking at, but it would be ancillary to our main um, strategy continue to buy existing income um, and where there is active asset management opportunities to increase that income through taking stock back and refurbishing. Our model is more about built stock and refurbishing as leases expire. And then a question, um, you kind of mentioned the big box there, but differentiation from the tri-tax and the, and the big box um, REITs, what, what, what's the differentiator? What do you yeah. get warehouse exposure that you wouldn't get with them? Yeah, good, very good question. So um, our, our, our model, as I said, is 65% multi-let, 35% single-let. When we're single-let, our, um, our largest building will be 200,000 square feet, but most of our single-lets will be materially um, lower. We, we continue to look for the active asset management um, role within the larger single-let buildings. So, like the Iron Mountain example, we buy short-dated income. It's six months unexpired. We get a higher net initial yield as a result. We look to work with the tenant. We understand their drivers of occupation. And as I said in that example, we've just um, signed a new 10-year lease. That creates value um, in terms of rental uplift and the longer lease. So, this is not buying single let long dated income, only less than 15% of our rent is um, 
gear to CPI or RPI, remembering that most landlords that have an RPI or CPI index on their rent reviews, you have a wrap, uh, 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 a collar between one and three or one and four percent. So, um, you know, if inflation gets hold and goes north of three percent, then in a way, some of these longer dated leases linked to RPI are at risk of being um, uh, lagging um, market. So we'd much rather be linked to market rental value. And another question on um, so that the phenomenon recently about kind of the last mile, the, the the get ears. I think I've seen more adverts in London for these different services um, in, in in the last few months than anything else. Um, in, in these urban areas last mile or, 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 or deliveries within 10 or 15 minutes is that a market for you or, or is that they, those sites too small so um the dark kitchens and the 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 the, the pieces we are um, not invested inside the m25 the the pricing is so competitive to buy um two you know, we've seen 2.5% <clears throat> being paid in terms of a net initial yield. The implied rental growth is significantly stronger. When you look at our acquisitions last year, net initial yield of 6%. We know that long-term income is 60% of total return. When we're buying in um, motorway locations, then then th th this we follow where the occupational take up is coming so uh, yes there is uh, pressure on rents and shortage of stock inside the m25 but we think we can make strong margins in buying um, in the likes of milton Keynes um, and northampton where you get more yield day one so it's more defensive interestingly we've just had a tenant move out of um, m25 north london location coming to rugby why because um, he's really struggling uh, with rent with staff with ability to distribute nationally rugby much better national distribution location lovely Andrew we are out of time thank you very much indeed for joining us tonight thank you for having me and um, delighted to be here <laughs>